which was okay, which was great. I mean, at least we were still able to do something. I really rec- uh, commend PanCam for being able to pull something together because it was really important to be able to do that. And we still need that connection. We still need to reach out to people and to survivors. So we did it virtually last year. But what they're doing now is our next Purple Stride will be April 30th, 2022. And the unique thing about this is going to be all approximately 59 affiliates coming together on that same day in their area. Like we'll be in Huntington Beach. We have uh, L.A., we have San Diego, we have ev- almost every state will be having a Purple Stride on April 30th, 2022. So it's a great way to come out. Registration is free. So I encourage all people you, for Orange County, you can go to purplestride.org slash OC. If you don't know if where a Purple Stride is in your area, just go to purplestride.org and you'll be able to find something in your area to do. Thank you, 19-year pancreatic cancer survivor Roberta Luna for being on Impact OC. And I thank everyone for tuning in. I'm OC Talk Radio Public Affairs Director Don Camber. Have an impactful day. Thank you. OCTalkRadio.net. It's time for the Talent Talk Radio Show, brought to you by People G2, a nationwide leader in background checks and employment screening solutions. People G2 gives their clients access to the best human capital management and due diligence tools available. They are dedicated to helping their clients with all of their people-related decisions. To learn more, go to www.peopleg2.com. Talent Talk centers on the topics of talent recruitment and management, leadership development, company culture, and employee engagement. These are all timely topics for CEOs, entrepreneurs, HR professionals, and business leaders. We hope that as you tune in to listen each week, whether to the live broadcast or to the podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio, that you hear something you can take away that will help you grow and impact your career in a positive way. And now... Here's the host of the Talent Talk Radio Show, the founder and CEO of People G2, Chris Dyer. Good afternoon and welcome to Talent Talk. It's Tuesday, it's 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, which means we have two fantastic guests lined up for you to talk about talent, all things human, you know, management, leadership related. And I'm really excited to, to finish out the year i believe this will be our last show for the year for 2021 and it's been it's been a year it wasn't 2020 but it you know it's still been a year for everyone so we'll, we'll we're gonna hopefully uh you know end it with a bang here for talent talk you know this show really is built and and designed around my desire to want to have a great conversation with a really smart person and uh the caveat is i want to make sure that anyone who wants to listen in that wants to learn along with me uh, can do that. So uh, whether you are watching on LinkedIn Live, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter right now, you can uh, certainly on Twitter and LinkedIn interact with us and make comments and suggestions and uh, argue with us, whatever you like. Um, or if you listen afterwards on the podcast, great. You know, make sure you subscribe. Uh, you know, there's iHeartRadio, there's Stitcher, there's Spotify. Uh, you can go to talenttalkradio.com and subscribe to the, via Podbean. I don't care where you find us. Just pick one and then make sure you subscribe so you don't ever miss an episode. That's the most important part. Um, as I mentioned, we are live tweeting at PeopleG2 uh, or the hashtag Talent Talk. You can follow along there. Um, but we will uh, be kind of doing that as we go along. We like to kind of put things like maybe an important link or a book or a profile or something that you might want to write down. We make sure that we document that in those places so that you can find it, you can go back. Um, I know a lot of people are maybe busy while they're listening and they can't always write something down, so that's a great resource for you. All right, my uh, guests today include uh, Erica uh, Anderson uh, and Steve Van Belgen. So uh, we'll bring in Steve at, Stephen after the uh, uh, commercial break, but uh, my first guest is Erica. As I mentioned, she is a business thinker uh, a keynote speaker and author of, founder of, uh, and she, she's also the founder of Protus International, and that's, that's not the name of the book. So we'll find out what the name of the book is. But Erica, welcome to the show. 
Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. So why don't you tell them a little bit more about yourself and, and your book and, and you know, what's important for us to know for our conversation today? Well, so just a little context. So I um, started my company, Proteus, in 1990, and we focus on leader readiness. So we help leaders at all levels of organizations just be ready to have the skills and the mindset they need to be successful, whatever the future will bring. The future has brought a lot the last couple of years. And uh, my latest book, which came out in October, is called Change from the Inside Out. It's the fifth book that I've written, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about it. Change from the Inside Out. So there's a lot of books on change. I guess what's sort of what's different about your book, or what is it you're hoping people, you know, are going to be able to learn from from picking up a copy of your book? I really love that question. So two things, I think. When I write a book, it's always because I've gotten curious about something, and it's usually about something that's really going to affect leaders. And uh, we've had a change practice at Proteus for almost a decade, but I started three or four years ago, pre-pandemic, I started to get curious about two things. One was, why is change so hard for us? Because it is, change is hard. And then the other was, what actually happens when an individual person goes through a change, actually makes a change? And I felt like if I could find good, clear, kind of empirical answers to both those questions, it would be just dramatically helpful to individual human beings. And also, it would really um, uh, put a great, even a stronger foundation to our change practice. And I feel like I found the answers to those questions. Yeah, so you mentioned that change is hard. Why is it that change is so hard? What makes it, you know, difficult for us to do? And I guess especially professionally. Yeah, yes. Um, so when I started thinking about this, I'm a big student of history. I feel like so much of who we are now lives in what has come before. And so I started to think about our history as human beings relative to change. And I realized that until fairly recently, if you look at someone's life 100 years ago or 200 or 500 or 1,000, that life was pretty much the same from beginning to end, you know, 100 years ago. Someone would grow up in a town, probably the town where their parents grew up, and it was pretty stable. They grew up, they, if their dad was a farmer or a pipe fitter, they were probably a farmer or a pipe fitter. They had their church, they had their village, they had the food they ate, they had their rituals. And, and each individual person's life was pretty stable from beginning to end. And when there was a change, it was generally a threat or a danger, a war, a famine, a plague, an earthquake. And so I thought, wow, so what that proposed to me is that during the thousands of years of human history, we got pretty deeply wired to see change as dangerous and threatening because mostly day to day, our lives were not changing. And we got wired to really rely on homeostasis, that, that urge to come back to a known, to a stable pre-existing condition. So then 50 years ago, 60 years ago, as change started to ramp up and create lives that none of us had ever seen before, I, at the beginning of, of the Change from the Inside Out book, I use an example of myself. I'm old enough that when I was a little kid, TV was a new thing. So when I was little, we got our first TV. And then 10 years later, we got our first color TV. And that was the pace of change, you know, six or seven years. It took 10 years versus the 10 minutes it takes now for that level of innovation to happen. So we're still operating with this old wiring that change is difficult, that change is threatening. And even though cha huge changes now happen to us every 10 or 15 minutes, we're still wired to react that way, especially when changes are imposed upon us, as you said, professionally. So I came to the conclusion, we really need to rewire ourselves to live well in this new century. So, I mean, there are certainly changes that we might need to take on because the world has changed around us. To your point, right, from television, it could be that, you know, we started to learn how to type and we learned about computers and we had cell phones. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's things that happen around us, right? And I guess that's an evolution. And, and someone can avoid that, but, or they can, you know, learn it and get better. I think when we think about change, though, we're, we're talking about, you know, a leader who maybe isn't a very good leader, maybe is a poor communicator or gets, has, a, has a temper. Uh, you know, and we think about, well, how does that person change themselves to be a better version 
leadership and be a better leader or whatever that may be. Um, that's what I think about when I think of change, right? Not the should you continue to evolve as a person and learn new things as, as the world around us, you know, I guess changes is the only other word to use. But so is there a distinction there for you as well about what we're talking about from a, from a change perspective? It's a very interesting question, Chris, but I don't think so. And that goes back to the second thing I wanted to find out, which is what happens when a change comes at us. And what I discovered from a lot of observation and asking people and doing some you know, various kinds of information gathering is that there's a very predictable way that we react to any change that's imposed upon us, whether it's a, a systemic change or an organizational change or a personal change that somebody is requesting us to make. And what happens, we came to call it the change arc because you know an arc is it gets harder as it goes up and easier as it comes down. So it turns out that the first thing that happens when a change comes at us and whether it's you need to change or the situation is going to change, change comes at us and the first thing is we want to know some things about that proposed change. And it turns out that there are three things that we wanna know really consistently, no matter what the change is. We wanna know, what does this mean for me? Literally, how am I going to have to change? What does this mean for me? Second thing we wanna know is why is this happening? Because we have this preference for the status quo, we need some good reasons to change. So we wanna know why is this happening? And then the third, and in some ways the most important thing we want to know is what will it look like when this change has been made? You know, some of the research I did when I was writing the book, uh, a lot of psychologists now believe that fear of the unknown is our deepest fear. So when, when a change comes at us, it's just like, whoa, walking into a dark alley at night. We want to know what it's going to look like on the other side of that change. So we start gathering that information. You know, what does this mean for me? Why is it happening? What will it look like? And as we begin to gather that information, because we have this predisposition to think of change as threatening and dangerous, our initial mindset, it turns out, about most changes is that they're going to be difficult and costly and weird. Mm. <laughs> and difficult means I don't know how to do them and it's gonna be hard and things are gonna get in the way and people are gonna get in the way. So just difficulty obstacles. Costly means it's going to take from me things I value. And we assume that about a change. It's going to take time and money, perhaps, but more importantly, reputation. You know, I'll look like an idiot because I don't know how to do it or relationship or power. You know, it's going to take from me things that are important to me. And weird just means strange. You know, this is not how we do things around here. So we notice that that's how people, even as they're asking these initial questions, they're coming from this base of assumption of this is going to be difficult, costly, and weird. And then, and this is when I got excited, I noticed that when someone started to get open to a change was when their mindset shifted and they began to think that, oh, instead of difficult, costly, and weird, I can see how this change could be easy or at least doable, rewarding, more rewarding than costly, and normal. I can see how this could be normal. And one thing that we found out that makes change seem more normal is when you look around and see other people that you think of as being like you are doing things in this new way. Yeah. Or when someone you admire and respect, maybe your boss, maybe a mentor is doing things, that's, that normalizes it, right? So yeah. we realize that if we can help people through that top of the arc, then they're much more willing to be open to and accept the change, behave in the new ways that the change requires, and then the change can take place. So we realized that this helping people through that mindset shift was really the core of helping people to do new things, to change in important ways. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, and, and, and I think people could think, well, this is a big, complicated thing, but I've actually seen applications of this be fairly simple in that, you know, if, if I walked up to you as a stranger on the street and I had a box and I said, put your hand in there, you would probably say, no, I who are you? Why are you doing this? Right? Yeah, absolutely. But if your spouse walked up to you and said that, you might be more trusting. If your boss said that, you might be more trusting. Uh, of true. course, if you started to observe things like you could smell food coming from the box, you might know it's Okay, if you hear something rattling from the box, you might know you shouldn't do this, right? There are sort of 
clue. But the more information somebody has uh, to rely on, the more likely they are to be able to do the thing that we want them to do. And I think that's what leaders often miss out on, is they yeah. want to convince people they should change versus providing them the information about why the change is important, what will happen to them, what's in it for them. That's exactly um, right. Right, and creating yeah. that vision and allowing them to make the choice to change. 100%. And, and, and uh, also, boy, that's exactly right. And it's not only information, but also stories which are compelling and experience. Here, try this. You know, before you put your hand in, look in and see, oh, okay, there's something bad in there, right? So it's all of that. And, and it, make, it, it really makes sense. There's this um, very famous statistic from McKinsey that 70% of organizational change efforts fail. And underneath that, they say the main reasons for that failure are lack of management support and employee buy-in. And that's exactly what you're talking about, where leaders just say, do this, and I'm going to convince you, versus I'm going to help you through this very natural progression of hesitation to acceptance. And so a lot of the change um, work that we do is integrating that kind of practical, here are the nuts and bolts things that need to happen to make this change, and the human side, like how do you help people through that shift to where they can start to think, oh, I can see how this could be easy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I get the rewards. The rewards outweigh the cost, and you're doing it, and Amy, my boss, is doing it. Okay. You know, that people need to go through that. They need to be supported through that, and that's when change can actually happen. Yeah, and, and, and that's a really important way to kind of phrase it. I, I, you know, so many leaders are just trying to just go do this just because, right? And and then we begin to not trust them as uh, either. We begin to think, well, they're just, you know, they're pushing this stuff down on us. They don't understand. They don't know why we can't do this. They haven't, you know, they're not sitting in my seat and understanding how that change is going to affect me. Precisely. You know, all those types of things. But often they're also not doing it themselves. We, I, you know, when we work with people with this model, with change, we always say it's like when you're on an airplane and they say put on your own mask before attempting to help others. You yourself as a leader have to go through that arc and come to the point where you really can see, okay, this could be easy, rewarding, and normal. Because otherwise, if you turn to your folks and, and say, do this, and they look at you and you're not doing it and you don't buy it, you're, you're done. You're not going to have any credibility with them, right? Yeah. You know, one of the things we've always used and I've, I've you know, had my clients do is, you know, if you can find somebody, if you're, you're going to do something and you want to change something, let's just say we want to bring in a new piece of software, right? And if there's some people that get it that are super excited about that, and we, I call them champions. Yes. Right? They're, they're a real champion for this thing, and they understand it and they at a high level. They have the deep knowledge and understanding. It's great to send – I used to like to send those people – out to lunch, right, or get them in a meeting or whatever with the people who are most staunchly against the change and remove leadership from that conversation because that's yes. there's a power dynamic there, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, let the person who's super excited about it talk to the person who's super scared about it. And every single time, assuming it was a good idea, yeah. they they could help them see the light and they could move them so much faster than leadership. A thousand percent, Chris. I love that. The only caveat to that is you have to make sure, and I talk about this in the book, that those people who are already through the arc, that they don't um, they don't kind of blame or shame the people who that they understand that having some initial hesitation and asking a bunch of questions and feeling doubtful at first is perfectly natural. If they can be with people through that arc, then yes, I completely agree with you. Yeah, and we're, we're certainly seeing a lot of these kinds of conversations happening now with, of course, you know, vaccines and yes. uh, or pandemic and masks and you know, a lot of people who were willing to do these things right away. Some that a lot of people, I think, that waited and wanted to make sure that you know it went well. And then there are those that still won't change, right? They still yes. have to not make that decision. So. I think we're sort of faced with this every day. Now, yeah. one, one thing I did want to ask you is, there, are, are there situations, are there times in which you think that it's important that people don't change, right? That they might be being asked to change, but maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe they shouldn't be doing that. 
Yes, I love that question. So uh, the subtitle of the book is helping you, your team, and your organization become change capable. And when I first started writing the book four years ago, I thought, well, shouldn't it be change positive? But then I realized, no, it should just be change capable. And uh, what we found is that when people kind of really get this idea of the change arc and going through the mindset shift, if you can come to a change, it allows you to come to a change neutral, just neutral, not thinking automatically it's going to be bad or that it's going to be good. And if you come into a change neutral where you're saying, I don't know yet, could be hard, could be easy, could be costly, could be rewarding. I just don't know. Let me look and see. Then that allows you to assess change more accurately because certainly there are changes that are ill-conceived, unnecessary. So you want, if you, if you come at all change negative, then you can't actually tell whether a change is good or bad. But if you come into it neutrally, then you can assess it properly. I mean, I have the worst handwriting ever. I should be a doctor. I'm not smart <laughs> enough to be a doctor, but I have the handwriting of a doctor. So, you know, that old sort of wise tale, um, you know, but I've never felt the need to change that, right? I've never felt the need to, you know, I can read it, so it's fine. I can type things. I have a, I have a, an alternate way to communicate. I can type things that people can read perfectly well, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not writing a whole lot of handwritten letters, you know, to people uh, because my handwriting is pretty, pretty terrible. Um, you know, so that's not something I'm going to be focused on for change. But I think if my team told me, hey, we, we need you to listen to us more. Or I got some sort of important feedback that's going to impact my ability to lead or to help, the, help us reach our goals. Then that would be something I would think about. You know, how could I improve? Or how could I change? Or what, what that, other? That's you know, a great example, Chris. I really love that. And that really comes down to rewarding, right? Costly rewarding. Because change is more effort, it's not, it's harder than the status quo, then you really have to get accurate about assessing the reward. It's like what you're saying is, yeah, I could get better at the way I hand write, but that there's not a big reward to that. There's not a big reward to me or anybody else. So no, I'm not, and, and it would be difficult. So I'm not going to do it. But if your team asks you to do something and you go, okay, well, this might be a little challenging, but I think I can do it. And according to them, it would be a big reward to them. Okay, then I need to consider that. And that's what I mean about assessing change accurately, right? Yeah, yeah, and I just, uh, I know sometimes it feels like people, uh, we've talked about this a lot on the show, and I know it's change isn't exactly the same thing as weaknesses, right? We sort of tell people that maybe they're not as good in certain areas, and I'm a big advocate for people not spending a lot of time trying to be better at things that they tend to be weak at as an adult, right, as a full-fledged adult that maybe – if you didn't spend the time to learn how to be really good at math and you just are struggling at math, then maybe that's, you're not going to go be an accountant, right? You're not going to go into that job, but you're really good at talking to people and you should be doing jobs where you're really good at talking to people like sales or customer service or something yes. like that. Right? Yeah. No, I generally agree with you that it's much better to play to your strengths. And then this, this frame of easy rewarding and normal is so helpful to figure out exactly what you're saying. It's like, okay, so somebody's telling me that I need to get better at thing X. And it seems normative, like it's important maybe in my organization to be good at this, and it's really rewarding. I will get a lot of benefit. Other people, the organization will get a lot of benefit. Okay, then I guess I should consider it. But unless it's really rewarding and normative and not hugely hard, no, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's, uh, I, I guess, an important distinction because I've heard so many times that people say, you should go work on this thing. You're not, you're weak at this other area, but it has nothing to do with like their happiness, their income. Or exactly. whatever. And we're just sort of like trying to make everyone the same. Like everyone should be equally as good at all of these things. And it's, I, it makes I no could, sense to me. could not agree with you more. And the distinction I make a lot in the book is necessary change. Change that is really going to make a big improvement for you, for your team, for the organization. And that's possible. I mean, some things are so overwhelmingly difficult that even if they do get a reward, it's like, no, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned the pandemic a little bit, but what, what, what do you think going through the pandemic has taught us about change? I hope, and this may be me being too optimistic, but I hope that it has made people in general more open to the possibility of change. Like I remember when, you know, March of 2020, 
and this is going to seem goofy, but the very first thing I heard that made me feel like, oh, this is real, is that they had canceled the St. Patrick's Day parade in New York City, which I guess had happened for 250 years without being canceled. And I thought, oh my gosh, can they do that? And then I heard they canceled the NBA finals. It was like, oh my gosh, can they do that? And I feel like over the last two years, we've all had so many, is that possible? They closed schools, they did, you know. So I feel like, and I see it now kind of with the great resignation and some of the social justice things that are happening that people are saying, we can we can change these things that have not ever changed. We've changed a lot. Maybe we can change more than we thought. And I see that as an actual benefit. Right, right. I agree. I mean, there was so many things that I thought might take 20 years for us to even consider, right? like remote work, you know, and I mean, bank tellers worked from home. I mean, like for a while, I mean, it's, that exactly. it blows your mind, right? But exactly. when you're being forced into something, sometimes, a, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Mother right? of invention. <laughs> and I feel like remote work is a great example. I don't think, my, you heard it here, I don't I think we're ever going to go back to everybody's in an office full time five days a week. I think we have too many options that we've found work. Right. So I think there's a lot of a lot of options that are open to us now. Well, most important question of the day is how can people find out more about you? How can they, you know, where should they go? What sites and where can they find your books and all of that? Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, you can go to my company website, which is Proteus, P-R-O-T-E-U-S, dash international.com and find out about what we do. You can go to my website, which both of my names are spelled weirdly, E-R-I-K-A-A-N-D-E-R-S-E-N.com, ericanderson.com. And there you can find out about the company, about this book and my other books, about my podcast, which is monthly, um, you know, everything you ever wanted to know, you can find out there. Sounds good. Well, um, I really appreciate you being on the show and giving us such great insights and uh, uh, really focusing on an important uh, topic of change. So we'd love to have you come back, um, you know, at some point and uh, give us a, you know, kind of a, an update on all the cool things you're doing. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a book that, besides your own book, if there was a book that someone should think about reading maybe next year, is there one that you're typically suggesting or one that you always have, have as a go-to or maybe you've read recently? My, and it's almost 20 years old now, but one of my favorite books is Good to Great, Jim Collins' book. Yeah. I think yeah. that a lot of the stuff in there still holds true. In fact, I was just quoting from it today with a client about change of being in um, technology as an accelerator. So I love that book. If someone hasn't read it and really is interested in understanding business, I would always recommend that. That's a great one. So we haven't had it uh, suggested in a long time, so I'm glad that uh, you were able to do that. But uh, again, thank you so much for being a part of the show. And we'll be right back after this uh, quick commercial break with our uh, next guest, Stephen Van Be Van Begellum, if I'm saying that correctly. All right, thank you so much, Erica. Thanks, Chris. Bye. <laughs> Imagine buying a newspaper and discovering that the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much that stays the same for six months. And the same thing goes for background checks. In a time when so much outdated information is being passed around, it's good to know that People G2 offers something different. At People G2, we provide today's intelligence, not yesterday's news. Our value-added approach offers you a fully FCRA-compliant solution that includes up-to-the-minute information. By combining industry-leading technology with old-school human investigation, People G2 is able to give you information that is accurate right now, delivered quickly through our online system or integrated with your HR system. So ask yourself, are you comfortable working with old news or are you ready for a different kind of background check company? Visit PeopleG2.com or call 800-630-2880. That's 800-630-2880 or peopleg2.com. The Wooden Floor is a nationally recognized, award-winning nonprofit that gives underserved Orange County youth the tools to live fuller, healthier lives through a unique approach grounded in dance. The Wooden Floor makes a long-term investment in these young people, providing free intensive dance education supported by academic and family services. The result is students graduate high school and attend college at a rate about three times greater than their peers. Find out more at thewoodenfloor.org.
It takes 12 years to create a graduate. It takes about the same time to create a dropout. And at the end of the day, the difference between a child becoming one or the other could be you. So United Way is asking you to make a pledge. Tutor a child who needs help. Mentor a kid who needs someone on their side. Volunteer to read with children. Because when a child advances, we all advance. Be a reader. Tutor or mentor. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Take the pledge now at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Whoa, a digital music player. Thanks, Mom. Glad you like it. We can finally toss out that old massive stereo. Mom, you can't just throw out electronics. They need to be recycled or donated. Recycled? Like aluminum cans? Yeah, you just go to greenergadgets.org, enter your zip code, and it tells you where the nearest certified recycling center is. Um, I knew that. Okay, Mom. Recycling electronics is as easy as buying them. Log on to greenergadgets.org to find electronics recycling options near you. The pandemic has brought out the best in millions of Americans. Unfortunately, it's made another persistent pandemic worse, domestic abuse. People in abusive relationships are now often trapped at home with those who mistreat them emotionally or physically. We can help with emergency housing, counseling, legal aid, and more. Are you being abused? Know someone who is? Call WTLC at 1-877-531-5522. 1-877-531-5522. Speak up. Save a life. BBC News, I'm John Shea. President Biden has been addressing the American people, addressing, the, excuse me, urging them to have coronavirus vaccinations and booster jabs. He said it was their patriotic duty to do so and that they owed it to their loved ones to be safe. The answer is straightforward. If you're not fully vaccinated, you have good reason to be concerned. You're at a high risk of getting sick. And if you get sick, you're likely to spread it to others, including friends and family. <clears throat> the unvaccinated have a significantly higher risk of ending up in a hospital <clears throat> or even dying. Almost everyone who has died from COVID-19 in the past many months has been unvaccinated. The Omicron variant of the coronavirus now accounts for almost three quarters of all COVID-19 cases in the United States. Earlier, the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, promised a $100 reward to everyone who gets a COVID booster jab between now and the end of the month. Several European countries have announced that they're tightening measures to fight the coronavirus. They include Germany, whose Chancellor Olaf Scholz says the restrictions will come in next week. Our Europe regional editor, Danny Eberhardt, has more details. A decidedly downbeat Chancellor Scholz said he wished he had a cheerier message for Germans shortly before Christmas. But, he stressed, the country could not shut its eyes to what was happening. Tight restrictions on gatherings where at least one person is unvaccinated remain. But from December the 28th, looser restrictions will also apply to people who've been vaccinated or who've recovered from coronavirus. Such gatherings will be limited to 10. Fans will once again be banned from football matches and sports events, and nightclubs will close. The ruler of Dubai has been ordered to pay his ex-wife, Princess Haya, a divorce settlement which could reach more than $700 million, the biggest in British history. The judge at the High Court in London said the princess and her children faced an ever-present threat from their father, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. The funds in the settlement are for security and to support their lifestyle, as our security correspondent Frank Gardner explains. The sums are absolutely eye-watering. I mean, between three and four hundred thousand dollars a year alone just for the pets. Three cars had been given to one of her sons, who's only age nine. These are very, very, we're not talking about tiny little toys here, we're talking about expensive things that can actually drive. But security really has been the main thing because the judge ruled in her favor that she needed, as he put it, watertight security because the main threat to her security came not from outsiders, but from her ex-husband himself. That report from our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. You're listening to the latest world news from the BBC. Recording stopped.